Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Donald Mackay, for the invitation. Um, and it was actually, I can say, a really great pleasure for me today to be able to spend time with um, students in a really, in really, I can say, wonderful conversations about their thesis work. For me, it's actually the second time I've been to the school. Um, I came a few years ago, actually, at the invitation of Lola Shepard, and was really intrigued with the school at that time. And telling Lola I was really impressed with the school, and actually, the second time around, it it becomes even clearer that you have a really something very wonderful out here in Cambridge, which I've understood is an interesting new construction um, that's, that's very, very interesting. So what I'm going to try to present today are quite a lot of slides that I'll go very quickly through, as architects tend to do. Um, and it, it begins with work I've done together with Marcel Smets on this book that Donald uh, held up for you. And it's a, it's a book that I made together with Marcel Smets, who's a colleague of mine in, in Belgium. He's recently retired. Um, he used to be the, the so-called Baumeister of Flanders, or the state architect of, of, Flan of, of Flanders. And we worked on this together for five or six years. And for us, it became um, a really interesting project that we are both driven by, because we're very interested in urbanism. And for us, infrastructure became one of the most interesting ways to understand urbanism. Because today, throughout the world, no matter where we are in the world, public authorities continue to view infrastructure as a primary field of investment. And actually, architects used to be the designers of infrastructure. And much of this infrastructure is now being designed by engineers. And we start to believe that we as architects, we as designers, need to reclaim the field of urbanism, and therefore begin to reclaim the field of infrastructure design. And so in our world of, in the world of today, where the urban world is being increasingly produced by private capital, infrastructure is one of the backbones that we can reclaim as designers in order which to graft the urban world. So when we started to work on this book, which I can say took five or six years of research, we, we saw infrastructure design emerging as one of the last resort to allow public authorities to give structure to haphazard development and to reclaim the discipline of urbanism. So that was our first motive to do this. And so what we see the book doing is trying to distill the attitudes and themes and therefore to start to make almost archetypes or taxonomies to understand the way in which transport infrastructure affects the spatial environment and how it's perceived. So that's where you begin to see these four entries, mobility, physical presence, movement, and public character. And what we did, and actually we had to keep revising our research because we made for ourselves we based it on case studies, and we said the case studies had to be relevant. They had to be recent, so they had to be 15 years. So every time we took longer to do our research, we had to throw out projects and bring in new projects, and they had to be implemented. So in terms of the four entries, so for us, the case studies aren't necessarily fixed, but they're more a kind of classification in which they try to distill an attitude. Um, we also tried to make the book something that had small essays and then kind of what we called major cases and minor cases um, where people could maybe not spend a lot of time reading because we realize architects don't necessarily like to read so much anymore. But we also made it almost a picture book as well so people could just look at images and, and read small titles and still catch the idea. But for the first idea about mobility, it was also an introduction to the whole book. So to try to constitute how the footprint of urbanization is explored through networks and how the networks structure urbanization and how these networks today, on the one hand, are forming global characters or they can strengthen local identities 
The physical presence had a lot to do with how these very large-scale elements that infrastructure are, how they're integrated into a landscape and how they either cause hindrances or they can become opportunities to refurbish environments. The third one about movement had to do a lot about the relation between movement and perception and how different um, architects, urbanists, landscape architects work with infrastructure in order to um, stress uh, choreography through a landscape with infrastructure. And the fourth one for us is one of the most interesting, of trying to understand how today we can think of infrastructure as a primary public space. So where we're more or less in a world where classical ideas of the public realm are being compromised by um, collective public, where the, 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 the public realm is being compromised by private space, such as shopping malls and parking buildings, we can begin to take this back in the design of new infrastructures. So I'll just briefly go through a selection of a few of these, each of the four chapters and a few examples from them. And then I'm gonna end with two design projects that I've worked on together with colleagues, one in Europe and one in Vietnam, which is my primary place of research and where I've done my, my own PhD work um, almost 10 years ago, 10 years ago now. So the first um, chapter talks about the imprints of mobility on the landscape. And it really talks about these, these different themes um, in general. Um, and what it tries to do is we, we, we make overarching essays where we also look back at historic examples. So some very classical examples um, where we understand that, of course, for instance, even looking back to 19th century examples, for instance, in Madrid, with Soya y Mata, a very famous example, um, in the linear city, where a tram line was used to generate, um, as it is even now, um, development where the development capacity of a tram line is meant to turn over the cost of its construction. So this was already done quite some time ago in, in Madrid as a, as a development project. Of course, one of the very well-known projects in the world is made already starting in 1970s with great political will by the mayor, Jaime Lerner, who is a three-term mayor, great vision, um, linking inter-districts, starting with minibuses in the core where you couldn't have the larger buses for a population of 2.2 million in Curitiba but also coming to the design, down to the design of the icons of the red tubes. Um, so having a very smart design that also had incredible public policy. Um, so that's where the politics, the policy, and the design all come together in an incredible interplay that linked in recycling systems, payment policies for, for the poor, etc. Other very interesting projects um, emerging in places like the Netherlands. Um, this is a, a very interesting project for, you could say, um, a new town development in the Leitzer Rhein by the, um, the group Max One from 1997 to 2005, where they designed a series of bridges basically based on um, turning radiuses that you get out of Neufert. So very pragmatic, uh, but developing a whole series of what they called orgware, um, which is a series of um, bridges that then work for different, um, but work as a system, as a way to give identity to this uh, new town development. So some of the, the bridge, bridges are then for, um, only for bicycles, some that are only for pedestrians, and then some that allow for vehicular transport. But coming to a systemic design. Incredible public transport systems, of course, I think some of the most progressive are in France, um, both as citywide systems, but also as 
nationwide network systems. Here is the TGV Mediterranean, so the southern system. Um, an incredible system. This one is uh, showing th the three examples in Aix-en-Provence, Avion, and Valence. Um, and it's done together with the state enterprise of AREP, but then together with the landscape architecture firm of Divinia Del Norte. They've now split and become uh, two separate firms. It used to be a husband and wife firm from 1994 to 2002. And what's quite astonishing about these uh, projects is they not only make an incredible choreography through the landscape, but they also upgrade urban areas and the larger territory itself. And in this case, they relate to the agriculture area of the, of the place. So they, they relate very much to the region's identity. So in that sense, they're, they're incredibly beautiful. And what you're seeing with all the green is these are the parking lots. So of course, these places are interchange for kind of park and ride. And the parking becomes almost park as well. So they're, they're very beautiful systems. Another thing about enhancing a regional character is also a new area in Amsterdam. Um, so the Eiberg area, building in the water, as the Dutch tend to do. Um, these are a series of bridges by Nicholas Grimshaw, um, made in Amsterdam from 1997 to 2001. So it's a whole family of bridges. Again, um, transport for, for cars and for trams and for buses but giving that identity, strong identity to the area through a family of, of transport um, areas, in this sense, bridges. The second chapter starts to go through, again, categories of the physical presence in the landscape. Um, again, go through in a series of, of themes, um, talking again how these large infrastructures go through areas and, and potentially transform them. And of course, it starts always, we start the, the ch each, each chapter with uh, essays that start with historic examples and, and other contemporary examples, say, on a, that we don't treat as full cases, but as, say, minors, what we call minor cases, but always starting with history. Um, they're wonderful historical examples. I mean, um, Haussmann is usually considered um, a guy who bulldozes through, through Paris, but also he made all the boulevards that we all love in Paris. Um, and I think it's very interesting to, to understand what Haussmann did is his, his boulevards are simultaneously autonomous, but also incredibly embedded in the fabric of the city. They're brutally imposed, but they also extend to include a system of parks, squares, and monuments. And they also included an incredible vision of integrity, where they were strategically and tactically located to take advantage of existing monuments and amenities. They responded to topography, and they created real estate opportunities. They also have an incredible sectional richness within them, where they were explicitly designed with the landscape. They were designed with a landscape architect. He was the... He was working with Napoleon, of course. It was part of the whole Second Empire Paris. With street furniture, with building edges, and more importantly also with the building utilities underground. It was the first time this was really done as an in integral urban project. So all the surfaces below were built concurrently. Um, and it formed a brand new system of transportation, promenade, utilities and power. So it was a very important moment in urbanism and in transport. Oops, I think I missed a slide here. After this should have been Olmsted, but maybe he will reappear later. Because um, there should be Olmsted's uh, system here as well. But um, So we're going now um, also to seeing the system of um, the Boston Central Artery Project. So here are seen systems of um, covering um, and uncovering. 
So what happened in the Boston Central Artery Project, which many people know, it was about um, a project that was um, taking away the so-called uh, green um, snake that went through, through Boston and making um, a park system. And then on the other hand, we again have uh, the Light to Rhine project, another part of the Light to Rhine project by Max Wan, which was trying to, in the, the making of the highway system, explicitly covering it over and creating park systems, not unlike what they've done in, Bos uh, sorry, in Barcelona, where many of the, the ring roads are, are covered with, with parks. So what we see also here in, in um, France, in Paris, is a really wonderful project, um, a very difficult project, that's covering also a cut through the city. So this is a cut um, that was made on a strip of the city in the north of Paris. It used to be a street that was linking a royal route, and it eventually became an industrial area. And this was a covering that reconnected two pieces of the city and had to be done very carefully because, of course, you can't really um, grow plants on top of a very, uh, uh, on a section that's very slender. So they had to put all of the vegetation along the sides. This was done um, with very careful um, consultation with the, the people on both sides, say, of the, of the, the, the the area that was, you can see the before and after photos on the, on the top. Um, so it was very careful consultation with the two sides. So here, sorry, we have Olmsted. Olmsted also is a historic example, um, is, is very important in this, in the story of connecting um, pieces in the, in the landscape and as transport infrastructure. Most people, of course, know this project simply as a park project, but it was also a very important infrastructure project. Olmsted began this project, of course, as a very pragmatic project. He was hired by the Health and Sanitation Department in Boston to basically drain a swamp um, so the, to control a natural ecology of tidal wetlands. But it became, of course, a wonderful system of parkways. This um, also later becoming what's known as the Emerald Necklace, um, also started to become an incredible precedent for linking urban planning, civil and sanitary engineering, landscape architecture, and transport planning. So somehow, like Raymond Unwin's close, Soye Imata's and linear, Corbu's linear city, road and infrastructure became backbones of, of settlement because all the, the real estate value around it rose. Um, also in this, this chapter um, about the, the physical presence, this is a project in uh, Louisville, in Kentucky, um, where George Hargraves, a very, very good landscape architect who works mostly out of California but does projects uh, now literally around the world, he say repaired a very complicated highway spaghetti infrastructure um, through landscape means, where he used a lot of earthworks and to reconnect the city to its waterfront. So it was a, it was a quite interesting project that, that occurred over 10 years, from 1999 to 2009, in order to, to connect brownfield sites and the, to reconnect the city to its, to its waterfront. So this is also a really interesting project. Um, this is a, um, you'll see two projects from this city. Um, it's in Strasbourg, France. So again, part of France's incredible investment in public transport. So Strasbourg has, has been one of many cities in France that's invested enormously in public infrastructure. It's had a lot of, a uh, great deal of political will coming from mayors. So the strength of mayors in the cities in France, a lot of political will, and many of their mayors have, by the way, been architects um, and people with planning backgrounds, which I think is really interesting, that a lot of architects and planners become political advocates and become politicians. Um, 
Strasbourg um, has invested a lot in tram lines. So they've made a strong policy to leave the cars on the periphery of the city and to make incredible systems of public transport to the center. And from that, they have hired a lot of well-known architects and artists also to, to make this very attractive, to make it part of the attraction of getting people to try to leave their cars, and get out of their cars. And at strategic points, they've made a series of park and ride um, facilities. So this is one that they've made on the northern apex of the city and one of the, the main lines, it's line B, and they hired Zaha Hadid. So this is a, a project that's at the intersection of a highway, a bus, and a tram system, and a huge parking area. So it's one of these places where you park, and then you can catch a bus or a tram um, into the city center of Strasbourg. Um, and as you can see from the um, architecture, it's very much Zaha Hadid, where the folded, um, the landscape, the infrastructure fuses uh, with the landscape through, through the architectural articulation. So the third section in our taxonomy is very much about the perception of the landscape, um, again, through a series of themes, and, and also looking back on history, of course, looks very much, well, one of the many things in history it looks back to is the work of the view from the road of Appleyard, Lynch, and Meyer from 64, and their alternative route for the ring road around Boston, and where they really tried to, to bring aesthetics back into planning and design. But also, interestingly, this is what you're seeing, the other, this, the other the kind of poster, it's, um, it's actually Nazi propaganda for the, for the Autobahn um, of in 1936 cover of one of their journals for, um, or one of the propagandas for the, for the, the road um, and having picnic on the highway. Um, so a kind of romanticizing of modernity with this kind of pastoral imagery. But during the Nazi time, where the highway was really made of these military roads, so mixing military roads and tourism, which is also quite um, interesting mixture of imagery. Of course, perception, um, also I think a super interesting project, also for its representational value, but also for the thinking, came from Louis Kahn. Um, there's a whole series of um, images that come from this project, we just show one, um, but is um, when Louis Kahn um, took, took Philadelphia as his adopted city coming from Estonia um, in the 1950s scene. This is a project he wasn't commissioned to do, but just doing in his free time, um, evenings, weekends, and being very frustrated by the change of um, the city as it was changing after World War II, the American city with the car. But also, of course, if you all know the writing of Louis Kahn, the, the writing he made to go with this, talking about, for this one, he, he called it, the cities are like, the expressways are like rivers, and he likened the whole mobility system to natural processes. And, well, he gives a whole explanation that the circles, which are parking areas, are like dams, and you could change the flow of of the, the rivers, which were the, which were the roads, and he, he kind of made this, you could change the tempo of the traffic um, in, a, in a very beautiful series of drawings. Um, but also this whole notion of, of perception. Um, again, a kind of another bad guy in urbanism who made some very beautiful things, I think, is Robert Moses. Um, so in, between 1934 and 38, this is the Henry Hudson Parkway um, that connected Lower Manhattan to Westchester County. Um, so 178 kilometers were connecting five different parks, always with a view of the Hudson River, um, and this whole notion of parkway. So you're not just driving on a stupid road, but you're driving on a parkway, something very beautiful with tree lines and parks. Um, and then here what you're seeing is um, the Via Doctor Zart by Patrick, Patrick Berger, 
and some landscape architects, and I, I think it's really the precedent of the High Line. Uh, it was made in Paris, and it turned a, a disused train line into a, into a walking promenade where you have a different view of the city and with shops below. Um, so this kind of idea of industrial archaeology, but also a pedestrian infrastructure. Where I'm coming from in Norway, so a, a very rich country that can afford such um, um, uh, opulence, this is spons a project sponsored by the Norwegian Public Road Administration. It's called the National Tourist Routes, which was commissioned in 19, uh, 2005, 2006. And it, well, you could say it kind of maybe kills what it, um, all these wonderful places where in, out in, the, in nature makes kind of Kodak moments of them. So I'm not necessarily in agreement with this project, but anyway. Um, it it um, commissions, gives wonderful commissions to young architects to make these very beautiful places to look at wild nature. It's no longer wild, clearly. Um, another really, I think, fantastic project, and this one wasn't realized, but we put it in anyways because it's going to be realized, so we broke our own rule. Well, rules are meant to be broken, so we broke it in this case because it's so spectacular, it's, and it's going to be realized. It's by Dietmar Feichinger, who's a wonderful um, designer, mostly of bridges. And this is the new um, jetty for um, Mont Saint-Michel, where he broke 120 year, the dike that now gets you there with, with car. And he said, you can't go there with a car anymore. Uh, you have to walk. Um, and you, you change the whole part. You have to park, then you have to take this long walk. And he also restores the ecology of the river. So it's a, it's a really fascinating project that tries to restore a kind of estuary and ecology and, and makes a whole new approach to the... So it's another kind of ecology and another kind of transportation infrastructure. This is also a wonderful project in Melbourne. So the northern gate to the city of Melbourne, which is um, a sound barrier for um, the, re the residential areas. Um, it's a piece of concrete and then Cortan steel and then another piece of it is a light wall that corresponds to the cars that go by it. Um, and then this is the, the other piece of Strasbourg that I think is a really wonderful project and perhaps interesting for, for Toronto and its surroundings because it's, it's really spectacular. So it's part of the bigger vision of Strasbourg and France to bring public transport to all the different areas. It was designed as, this is line A, the other area where you saw the, the park and ride by, by Zaha Hadid was part of line B. This is by a landscape architect named Alfred Peter, who's a really spectacular landscape architect, and then there were many superstar architects involved as well. Um, but what this, he believes in the statement that he says is he says the tram is a vehicle for designing public space. And on this one line that starts at just as 10 kilometers long and it goes from southwest to north, nor northwest to southwest through the city, it's just even along these 10 initial kilometers. So of course you have the continuity of a line, but within these 10 kilometers, also design difference in the section distinctive differences. Um, and they, in the road section, they took, over, they took over the car lines for the tram. So the section was there. It's an existing city, just like we have existing cities everywhere. And it just took over the lanes of the cars for the tram. But as you can see, according to the different sections of the city, whether it was more residential or more commercial in the different sections that existed, the, the the different materials also change, so sometimes you even have grass within the tram line itself. So you have some of the street furniture that remains the same, so you have continuity and identification, but you also have differences that tries to respond to the local condition in the, the urban or the residential or the, or the commercial environment. And finally, the last chapter that we ended with was for us the one um, saying that perhaps ultimately infrastructure is, is really a public space. 
Um, we know, and the ones I will show you here, the ones that are I mean, so much, of, perhaps the place where we see it most now is in airports where things are turning into shopping malls, but trying to take that so that's a money-making commodity or leftovers. But for us, um, when we look back in history as well, our, our, our railways, this is Penn Station, they used to be a place where the different social classes and place people of different status used to really be able to mix. It was a place that mixed between the countryside, uh, well, the city met the voyage. And even before air, airports became places, bubbles of secu before security and noise regulations took over, you could also go and watch uh, this kind of excitement of transportation to a certain degree. Um, Certain different examples you have of now the reclaiming, um, unfortunately, in many places, um, rail transport, public transport is in decline. So you have the transition from, well, it's very well known, I think, in North America, and this is an example from North America, is the, the rails to trails um, programs. Um, but of course, public space. Um, and, and making of public space over infrastructure and inclusive of infrastructure is, is becoming more and more inventive, but still understanding the grandeur of, of historic examples here in, in, in places like Moscow, but also brand new systems. I mean, Copenhagen has wonderful um, metro stations um, where they're all very similar and designed to a level of detail, um, even the clocks, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, every time they make a new station, it's with as much attention and care um, and Danishness. Uh, and finally, I end with this one. This is actually one that my colleague Marcel Smets was in charge of. Manuel de Sola Morales um, was the architect of the bus station. But it's also trying to give dignity to even things like parking lots. So these uh, mushroom columns are part of the parking, um, but it's a place that's trying to celebrate movement in tunnels. Um, it's a place that's bridging, trying to link public space of the city square to the bus station, um, et cetera. So from these examples of uh, the book we made, um, I'll jump to some design projects, uh, try to quickly go through them. But in between, I also, um, a colleague and, and friend, um, a, per, a landscape architect who's working, um, who's the head of STOS, uh, Landscape Urbanism. Um, this is from an essay he wrote in a, a book that was eventually published as the, in the Landscape Urbanism Reader, Chris Reed. I think it's a very nice um, essay, uh, quote, sorry, where he talks about how infrastructure can become landscape and it's a lot about creating um, new public or new civic realm and where it can begin to, to link many things. Um, and basically, for me, well, what I've underlined in orange is what I think is really wonderful in talking about places that literally work. So for me, this is the potential of infrastructure, where you think about infrastructure in a much broader sense of, sense of the word. So that's, for me, the working idea or working definition of infrastructure that I'm going to try to reveal uh, quickly in, in two projects. So this is a, this is, um, a place in Belgium. It's a um, place called Kortrijk. It's otherwise known as um, the Texas of Flanders uh, in the sense that it's fragmented and diffused, as you can see. It's a place that has what's uh, simultaneous Simultaneity of difference, or sprawl. <laughs> it's got a population only of 75,000, um, and it's based on the Leia River. It's uh, 42 kilometers from Ghent and 25 kilometers from Lille, so in France. It's right on the border of France. Um, and this is, uh, and it's part of what's known as though a larger region called the Lille, the Euro Metropole, which is, includes. Lille, Quartrike, and Tournai, so it's, it's of a larger region, which has 1.9 million. And it's a place that has been around since the Middle Ages, 
and it got its wealth from wool and flax. But now it's really uh, entre- known as a rich entrepreneurial city in southwest Flanders with energy, defense, and service industries. So it's um, a strange place. And where we worked, um, and I'm saying we, it was a workshop that I led with my colleague uh, Bruno de Mulder with a series of um, young architects, urbanists, and landscape architects in January of 2012 for an interregional, it was a kind of brainstorm for an interregional um, urban firm, uh, interregional municip- like interregional municipality of 17 municipalities to give them ideas of what to do. And so you can see on the top uh, left of the screen is the old city going diagonally across is the E17, a big highway. And on the, the other side of the highway is what's called Hog Kortrijk, High Kortrijk, it's a bit higher in topography. And it's the post-war city, post-war car-based city extension. And it's basically where there is, sorry, where there's big boxes um, and an archipelago of monofunctional elements. There's a hospital, um, an expo center, etc., and a series of fragmented areas. So what we base the whole, um, so the city center is Kortrijk that you see. And what we started with is to make public transport, to get people out of the cars, because it's a car-based city. And we made a public transport system based on AZ is the hospital, Expo is the Expo Center, and then Kato Kulak is, is colleges, and then the Langemute is another um, regional area that's connected. So we decided to base the whole principal design on making a public transport area that doesn't only connect our area across the highway, but begins to make a regional transport system based on trams, high-speed trams, that starts to connect the region to the city center and this place across the highway. So the whole um, city was connected to a regional network system of public transport, of tramways, and then connecting the countryside to a bus system. And this was based back on the example you saw earlier of Alfred Peter, and the example you saw in Strasbourg. But then more importantly for us is to use the public transport system to begin to qualitatively upgrade this area south of the historic core and to use the public transport system to begin to make public space and to find a way to densify this kind of sprawl um, of places um, that were on the south of the highway. So from the public transport that got away from the car system, we started to graft onto it a green structure. And the idea is that the green structure would also build on the existing. So the whole idea of this uh, project was to begin to read very carefully the logics of the existing system and to simply go one step further. So to read the existing forest structure, to read the existing water structure, and to push them one notch higher. And also the highway structure itself, we would start to downgrade it. So some of the excessive car infrastructure would be taken away and turned into soft infrastructure for bicycles and for um, pedestrians. And at the same time, massive earthworks would be built along the highway to turn into sound, um, sound barriers and to make bridges over the highway. So learning very much from, for instance, the Light to Rhine project of Max Wan and many of the, the projects, um, also the project in Australia, um, and beginning to, to understand 
um, also echo ducks for, for the kind of large stretch of, of the territory. So we'd start to have um, sound barriers and links across the, um, the highway. The overall structure would be what you see in orange. We would start to requalify and link. The, the buildings are in white. Um, the, the one in the, in the more the south, the southern, most southern, uh, southwest one is a hospital. Next to it is a is the big expo center. The smaller stuff um, is housing and colleges, extensions of the University of Leuven as well. But the orange is what we would call the civic spine. So this new, the way to, to qualify the tram line would to create a new kind of public space um, that would be linked to the public transport. But also the green, the new forest area, would, would build upon what was already there, but be much more radical and, and structure it even further and to create not the same kind of green everywhere, but to create a variation in the echo tones. So you create different kinds of areas for recreation and also different kinds of green for different kinds of species to be able to thrive. So it wasn't just one kind of green, but very different kinds of green with different kinds of vegetation. We also tried to work the idea that worked in with the green is that the parking areas would also become green. They would be parking and parks simultaneously. Um, and then densification started to work along the public transport system. So the densification would be of public spaces and eventually of some of the housing areas that they would no longer be small enclaves of small, in, in Flanders they call them fermetas, small Flemish farmhouse, looking like farmhouses but not really farmhouses. And so you would start to have a system of um, densification, but within the landscape, and also working with, with water systems and, and green. And here you see the, the, the civic spine, so where you requalify the public space along the transport lines and together with what you're densifying. And then the water system um, is, is working the whole story with retention basins and working with the par parking and for stormwater. And this would work a lot as cascades and, and water gardens um, with different references we had um, coming from, from different landscape architects, also integrating ideas for, for parking, again, with references to people like Agence Terre and Divigne de Lanquet. So in the end, you, you have a, a system where you requalify the civic spine together with, with green. And finally, I end with this project in some work in Vietnam, quite a different story. So it's not so much about requalification of urban areas, but the making of completely new urban areas. So I've been working quite a lot with the Vietnamese government in places, this is in the south of Vietnam. So in the south of Vietnam, I've been working in in the Mekong Delta, so a place where the French have done quite a lot of work to drain the um, swamps. The French were in Vietnam in, the, in Indochine for, from 1876 to 1954. Um, it's very interesting to see, it's, I'm sorry, this, this is the one slide that's not so clear, but the red dots are all major cities in, in the Mekong Delta. And what's very interesting is they came, their, their distance is basically all 60 kilometers apart. And that has to do with transportation by water. Because 60 kilometers, you could travel 10 kilometers an hour by boat, and then the tides would change every six hours. So it's basically 60 hours is what, is what, you, could, what you could manage before the tides would change on the boats when, when they were designing, the city, when the cities were being formed. So it's really interesting that when the cities were all formed that it was, it was 60 kilometers. So the city I'm talking about is Kanto. It's the largest city in the Mekong Delta. It's on the lower branch of the Mekong River, which is called the Hao River. 
And then I'll briefly show also Kamau, which is where we're starting to work now. It's the, 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 the lowest, the southernmost city in the Mekong Delta. So this I can skip. But what's very interesting is when we are working in, in Kanto, so we, we made the revision, we were commissioned by, and when I say we, it's um, my partner Bruno de Muller and I, through a commission of our, our office called RUA or OZA. We did it through the university with a small team. We ended up looking at both at Singapore and the, the Green Heart in, in um, Amsterdam, or in the Netherlands, sorry. Um, because our, our city, Kanto, is 60 kilometers long. <laughs> Uh, we are revising the master plan um, of the city. Um, it's a city that's now 1.2 million. It's going to 2.4 million by the year 2030. It's growing very fast. Um, but the idea was not to make it one big long linear city, which is the typical plan, but to understand how it could be a collection of cities. Um, so we are looking at some, some precedents. We are also very impressed in a certain degree by some ideas in Singapore, not the typical idea that Southeast Asia and Vietnam is usually impressed, as kind of Singapore is this skyline of wonder going from uh, the, the city skyline, but the idea that Lei Kuan Yew also planted, had the idea of a tree planting scheme in 1963 to plant, I forget now the number, but something like a million trees in Singapore, but also right now that Singapore is having one of the most progressive water policies in the world. They have to because their contract with Malaysia for water is about to expire. So they have a very interesting water policy on many, many levers. They have four different walls, a whole other story. Um, but Kanto is a super interesting city. Um, it's a water-based city. Uh, there's a 1923 map that you see on the right. Um, basically before it was uh, canalized by the both by the Vietnamese and the French. When we start to work, we, we end up making quite a lot of analytical drawings, both at the scale of the delta and of the, the city slash province. So you see the city, uh, the delta, and then the city. It's got the natural waterways and then the imposed Cartesian grid. Um, the cities, and then the way the cities work in Kanto. So in orange, you see it's mostly at the, at the waterways and then following the waterways. Very interesting to super productive landscape. Vietnam is, the Mekong Delta is considered the rice basket of Vietnam. But the special thing about Kanto is it has orchards. Um, so what you're seeing is basically everything is flat. It's centimeters of difference but on slightly higher land, you have orchards, you ha and you have vegetables. Otherwise, you have rice. We had to make topography maps. They don't really exist, so we made them in different ways. We did spot elevations. There's a difference, and the second one is alluvial soils compared to non-alluvial soil. And then the bottom one is flood maps. Um, and this became our first uh, design idea, which was about uh, um, a section, a conceptual section, it had to do with trying to balance cut and fill. And as you see, something we called again the civic spine. It's a concept we use very often that had a lot to do with public transport. Um, public transport, also in water transport. Um, it's very expensive, and the so bearing capacity in, of the soil in the Mekong Delta is horrible. It costs a lot of money to build roads because um, they have to drive piles very, very deep, cost a lot of money to build buildings over four or five stories. So we had an idea to build buildings only four or five stories or 12 stories and above, nothing in between, because it doesn't pay off. Because um, with four or five stories, you can do with kind of normal construction. And then we said you should build 12 stories or above, because then you can pay off the cost of driving the piles. Um, so you either have a... You have a low-rise and a high-rise city, but you don't have this medium-rise city. We also talked, we spent time talking to the Agriculture, Department of Agriculture, and talked to them much more about diversifying their agriculture instead of having it zoned so strictly, because they get a lot of, they're getting more and more 
problems with insects and problems that are, uh, well, I guess that's another story. But we ended up coming to a plan as a diagram like this. The existing center is the biggest circle. And what they typically do in Vietnam in the revision we made is not to, not to make a linear city along the river as a continuous strip, but to make separate islands where the water could then easily flow because the city floods a lot. And the orange line is the big civic spine, the big transport line, big public transport system that you'll see. Um, so this is the orange line is the public transport where all the civic amenities would be, all the schools. Um, big system of water management and a big system of public transport. So the green are orchards. The bright green is a linear park. So when it all comes together, uh, the white are urban islands. Dark green is a productive landscape. The orchards, the light green is rice. The bright green is a linear park where they could put all their golf courses, because every Asian city now needs golf courses. Um, the dark gray is industrial zones, because they need zones, so that's the industrial zones. But the bright orange is the, the civic spine. Um, this became the public transport map. So the blue is water transport, and the other places are tram lines. Um, again, based, public system is based on these kind of references. Um, and then these are the typical sections through the um, civic spine. So the civic spine always has attached to it local trees, um, always water, water system, always public transport, and then architecture. We didn't, we didn't really care about the architecture because that would take care of itself. Um, we wanted a lot of diversity in the section that it would change. There would be, again, this idea of Strasbourg was really important for us, that there would be a continuity, but there, because it's 60 kilometers long, the civic spine, we wanted the identity to change through the, through the tree planting. Tree planting in Asia is a really strong tradition so you wanted to build on that tradition and have local, local trees, um, but also the productive landscape, um, being able to integrate places for the scooters, places for the buses, and places for cars. Cars are invading Vietnam at a very high rate, and we can't deny it. I mean, it's part of the status symbol that they, they need, they want, and they will have. Um, so that was part of the story. Finally, this is the place where we're starting to work this, this southern tip with a beautiful landscape um, of mangroves. Um, again, centimeters of difference, a place that's changing radically. It was unfortunately um, bombed extensively by the Americans, by napalm. It's, it's, been, it's lost a lot of its ecology. Um, it used to be a mangrove, which is really important because it protects the coast. It's um, been lost by, been killed by the Americans, and now it's being killed by the Vietnamese because they're, they're taking it away to do tiger shrimp farming because it's much more lucrative than keeping a bunch of mangroves around. So it's, it's being lost. So you can see the map from 1907, 1917, sorry, to 2013. So our idea is to go from planning to planting um, and try to restore this ecology, and we're kind of at this stage now, so where you can at the same time have new infrastructure, have planning, and have planting and urbanization. Um, so that's kind of where we're standing. Um, I will end there, and just well, I just wanted to to also end with. Um, uh, one of the, the big things that I'm working on with my partner, Bruno de Mulder, we're, we're working on a series of books. And just to, to give credit to, these are, these are we're, we're working on a new, we used to have a, we're continuing a book series we started with another publisher, which was called Sun in the Netherlands, but they stopped publishing architecture and urban books, unfortunately. We're now continuing with um, people in Zurich. Um, and this wonderful picture that, that was used for the poster 
It's actually from Kong Jian Yu. <laughs> so just uh, that is not mistakenly giving credit to me. I wish it was mine because it's a wonderful project in China. But this is um, it's, a, it's a book that I've only edited, um, and it's full of wonderful projects about um, in Asia about water urbanism in in well, in, in in the East. Um, and the, and the project is, is from Kong Jian Yu, who's made uh, a series of fantastic projects throughout, throughout China, and actually now starting to do projects throughout the world. But just so that's not mistakenly thought of as mine, as I say, I wish it was mine, but it's not. And um, we're also working on a book, also where Kong Jian is involved, but about village in the city, so a wonderful phenomenon in China as well, but about um, villages that are kind of being eaten up by the Chinese city. Well, an interesting phenomenon, maybe not wonderful, but interesting to, to think about. Um, but thank you very much, and really, again, thanks for the invitation and the day of interesting conversation with the, the master students. <laughs>